On the 23rd of April 1991, Gerald Ratner, CEO of Ratner's Jewellery, took to the podium at the annual Institute of Directors Conference in London, England. He was about to deliver a speech, and though he didn't know it at the time, it was going to be a historic one. With just one short address, Ratner was about to destroy his company, ruin his reputation, send shares plummeting, start a media firestorm, and reduce his multi-million pound business empire to ruins. Gerald Ratner was about to give what would turn out to be, quite measurably, the worst speech in history. Ratner got into the jewellery business at the tender age of 15. That was how old he was when he was expelled from his local grammar school ostensibly for being too stupid. Ratner, however, was anything but stupid. He went to work for his father's jewellery business and spent the next few years watching, learning and making his own plans for the company. When he finally did inherit the chain of stores in 1984, he wasted no time. His approach to business was simple. Grab people's attention. Offer something cheap to buy but expensive looking and create a sense of urgency with limited time sales. He'd learned his trade by watching market walkers. Those who shouted the loudest and had the most eye-catching stools did the most business. And so he turned his father's modest jewellery stores into huge, shameless, discount jewellery megamarts. A typical Ratner's store was festooned with signage promising massive discounts, cheap jewellery and never-to-be-repeated sales, which were, of course, repeated week after week. As for his products, they looked the part, but were cheaply made and even more cheaply marketed. At Ratner's, you could stop in and buy a pair of earrings for less than a pound. To put that in context, the average spend on a piece of jewellery at a rival store at the time was around £300. Of course, other jewellers were appalled. This just wasn't how things were done. Jewellery was supposed to be expensive. It was supposed to be exclusive. A luxury good that only a few people could afford. Not something that you could pick up in bulk for a tenner. They snubbed Ratner, calling him tacky and cheap. Cheap he might have been, but the man knew his business. Within just a few years, he had turned his fortunes around, transforming a chain of failing jewellery stores into an empire with more than 2,000 outlets in the UK alone. Ratner's had fully half the market when it came to jewellery. And reputation-wise, while other jewellers weren't fans, consumers loved Ratner's cheap jewellery. Yes, it might be made of glass rather than diamond, but when you got right down to it, how many people could tell just by looking. And did it matter? Compared to any other jewellers on the high street, people who shopped at Ratner's were getting an incredibly good deal. Ratner became famous, or rather infamous, for the tactics he'd used to transform his father's ailing business. He was a controversial figure. At best, people saw him as a savvy businessman, responding to market needs and giving customers what they wanted. At worst, he was viewed as a cheap charlatan, selling dodgy goods that weren't even worth their minuscule price tag. Still, whether you loved him or hated him, you couldn't help but notice Ratner. He'd done something remarkable and was living a life of luxury as a result. He had his own private jet, his own helicopter and his own chauffeur to take him wherever he needed to go. Not bad for someone who'd been declared too stupid for school. Given his incredible success story, it was no surprise that Ratner was invited to speak at the annual Institute of Directors conference at the Royal Albert Hall in London in 1991. Coming to hear what he had to say would be 6,000 business leaders from the UK, all of them keen to learn how they could replicate the kind of runaway success Ratner was enjoying. If you've watched his speech, you'll know already that Ratner isn't a natural public speaker. He exudes nervousness. And perhaps that's why it all went so wrong. He'd worked hard for his fortune and it had landed him in the world of the business elite where he needed to learn how to fit in pretty quickly. This speech was an opportunity to prove himself as a legitimate business guru. So he put his heart and soul into writing it. 
Indeed, he rehearsed what he was going to say a number of times and even called in a public speaking expert to give him feedback. This expert gave him some resoundingly bad advice, saying that he should put in a couple of jokes. More fateful words were never spoken. Ratner took the advice. He put in a couple of jokes. Here are the ones that got the biggest laughs on the night. People say to me, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say, because it's total crap. <laughs> um, we even sell a pair of earrings for under a pound. Gold earrings as well. And some people say, well, that's cheaper than a prawn sandwich from Marks and Spencer's. But I have to say, the sandwich will probably last longer than the earrings, but anyway. <laughs> now, these jokes went down well at the conference, and they must have gotten a laugh during his many rehearsals as well. The trouble was, they were very clearly at the expense of Ratner's customers. And when Ratner's customers heard these jokes, they didn't find them very amusing at all. Ratner's speech ended with a deafening round of applause, and he left the stage thinking that it had all gone rather well. It was only the next day when the papers ran with the headline, You 22 Carat Mugs, that it became apparent that not everyone had loved his speech. Thousands of Ratner's customers who, surprise surprise, didn't like being painted as gullible, tasteless and cheap, queued up outside his stores to demand their money back. Share prices fell and then fell even further, and then kept on falling until a Ratner's share was worth less than a piece of Ratner's jewellery. In total, £500 million fell off the company's stock price in just a few weeks. To put that in context, that's the price of 500 million Ratner's earrings. Not being one to admit defeat, Ratner tried his hardest to pivot. He pointed out the many positive things he'd said during his speech, and when that didn't work, he started selling t-shirts and mugs printed with his misfired jokes. Unfortunately, much like his jewellery, nobody was buying. To try and salvage the situation, he hired a new chairman to run the business, taking himself out of the public eye. He was taken even further out of the public eye when that new chairman turned around and fired him. With just one speech, Ratner had gone from a millionaire business mogul to a jobless laughingstock. It was quite the tumble. A single 20-minute speech had destroyed a lifetime of work, wiped out his legacy and sealed Ratner's place in history. No longer would he be known as a savvy businessman, but instead as a joker whose terrible sense of humour cost him his company. Even to this day, massive corporate blunders are sometimes referred to as companies doing a Ratner. For a while, for old Gerald, things were a little bleak. He spent seven years loafing around the house in a pool of shame, until his wife threatened to kick him out if he didn't pull himself together. With that threat ringing in his ears, he started a new business, running a health centre. While he's tone-deaf for jokes, Ratner could clearly manage a business because within a few years his new enterprise was worth £4 million, and he was back to his old, comfortable lifestyle. These days, he's not exactly thrilled to be recognised as the person with quantifiably the worst sense of humour in the country, but at the same time he's found a way to own it. He travels around giving speeches, a risky move for someone with his track record, warning company directors not to make the same mistakes he did. He's a case study, and while it's probably not much fun being a case study for something so ridiculous, he's at least doing some good. Are there any lessons to be learned from the story of Ratner's terrible speech? Maybe a few. Maybe when it comes to speaking on behalf of your company, obvious as this might seem, don't tell the world that the products you've been selling them are total crap.